now, the greatest radio shows of all time. Suspense. The Shadow Node. Washington calling David Harding, counter spy. Classic radio theater. The Great Gildersleeve. Fibber McGee and Molly. Dragnet. Gunsmoke. The Lone Ranger. Now, step back into our time machine with your host, Wyatt Cox. Good evening, friends of the Inner Sanctum. An episode of the syndicated program, The Weird Circle. This episode, entitled The Pistol Shot, was originally broadcast on March 18th, 1945. The Weird Circle. In this cave by the restless sea, We are met to call from out the past stories strange and weird. Bellkeeper, toll the bell so all may know we are gathered again in the weird circle. again the immortal tale, The Pistol Shot. Listen, the bells, they toll the last requiem of Count Peter Markov upon the still, wintry Moscow air. This is the end of a brave and loyal man. Soon the body will be carried down the church steps and into the black hearse. The funeral procession will wind itself through the dark, quiet, snow-covered streets to the cemetery reserved for the officers of His Majesty's Hussars. I shall wait here in front of the church until they carry the coffin out. I shall follow in the funeral procession and watch with bared head while they lower the body into the grave. Yes. This is the least that I, Captain Nikolai Silvio, could do. (laughs) After all, Markov was my friend. Yes, my very good friend. We were always together as we were five years ago on that night when... Come, Nikolai. This is a night to celebrate. The Tsarina has achieved another birthday. The Tsarina's birthday... Come, my friend, another drink. No, no, Peter, I've had enough. Oh, nonsense, nonsense. Stefan! Oh, where is that pig of a steward? Stefan! Yes, yes, come, my boy. Uh, more vodka for Captain Silvio. See that his glass is never empty. Yes, Excellency. Ah, come, Peter. We'll drink to the health of Ilya Stanovich. Yes, I'll drink to that, Peter. Until the cup is empty. Uh, away with the glasses, my friend. Stefan! Fresh glasses. More vodka. This is a night to remember. Yes, excellent. Peter, Peter, I've had enough and you've had too much. I? Too much vodka? <laughs> My boy, you know me better than that. I still say you've had too much. Your hand trembled when you raised that last glass. I'll prove to you that I'm not drunk, my friend. How? Do you see that moth crawling along on the opposite wall? Yes? I'll wager you a month's pay that I can smash that insect with one pistol. <laughs> You're on, hey, Peter. I'll wager a whole month's pay. Now, gather around, gentlemen. A <clears throat> hundred rubles on Count Marco. Yeah. Ha! Oh, well, oh, Peter, oh, am I drunk or am I not? <laughs> this was Mark of my friend five years ago. A devil with a pistol and a devil with the ladies. He loved life then, did Markov. And I, well, I loved the ballet dancer, Ilya Stanovich. She was like a flame across my heart. When I danced with her, it was like walking on air. Her beauty was rare, exquisite, 
almost timeless. All I waited for was another promotion in rank before asking for a hand in marriage. One night, shortly after my pistol wager with Count Markov, I stopped at Ilya's apartments. She did not expect me, and it was rather late. As I got out of my carriage, I looked up at Ilya's window on the second floor, and what I saw there froze my blood. Framed against the blinds were two shadows, the shadow of a man and a woman. In close embrace, I hid behind a door on the lower floor and waited. And soon I heard the upstairs door open. Peter, you must be careful. Nikolai must not find out. Oh, Nikolai? Nikolai suspects nothing. You, my dear? I don't know. I'm afraid. We can never let Nikolai know. Never. But you will let me come again. Oh, yes. Yes, Peter. Peter, we'll never let Nikolai know, will we, Peter? You're lovely, Ilya. Lovely. Good night, Peter. Good night, Ilya. I shrank behind the doorway, saw Markov come down the stairs and walk out through the door. Markov, my friend. A cold anger gripped me, shook me as a terrier shakes a rat. I saw a blood-red mist, and in it was framed two faces, the faces of Ilya Stanovich and Peter Markov, laughing at me, jeering at me. But instead of causing violent action, my anger was cool, calculating. I cannot say that any plan formed itself in my mind then, but later, the manner in which things came to pass seemed to fit into a pattern begun at that moment. I walked slowly up the stairs. Who is it? Who is there? It's Peter, my dear. I forgot something. Peter? Nikolai. Good evening, my darling. Oh, I... I... You're so beautiful, Lydia. So beautiful. Nikolai, what are you going to do? So beautiful. No. No, I would not know, for no one would ever tell me, would they, Ilya, that my beautiful one loves another instead of me. Nikolai, it's you I love. I swear it, Nikolai. Only you. But while my back is turned... <laughs> oh, don't turn away, Nikolai. <laughs> don't go away from me. Don't turn your back on me like that. Nikolai. Nikolai, I love you. Nikolai, come back. <laughs> Farewell, my beautiful one. I closed the door and walked slowly away. My Ilya was left alone. And loneliness with a memory of happiness can be a poignant horror. Yes, it was punishment for such as she. The red mist was still in front of my eyes, but this time there was only one laughing, jeering face framed in it. The face of Count Peter Markov. He who lies still in death within that church. Peter Markov, my friend. His face swam in the red mist that stayed before me day and night, and I waited, waited for my chance. Finally it came. We were playing cards one night in the officers' club. I don't have any luck at all. Well, I'll see your hand, Count Markov. Oh, come, Major Voronov. Let's make this interesting. Shall we double the stakes already on the table? Very well. You've already won a fortune from me tonight. It's my only chance to recoup. How about you, Nikolai? I'll stay in the game, Peter. Uh, Nikolai, as an old friend, I advise you not to. I have an excellent hand. The stakes are pretty high. 500 rubles. I said I'll stay. Very well. As you wish. Show your hand, Markov. There it is. Well, gentlemen? You win. Yes, Peter, you win. I tried to warn you, my friend, but you wouldn't listen. You've had a phenomenal run of luck tonight, Mark. Well, there's a very good reason for his luck, Major. What do you mean, Nikolai? The hand is quicker than the eye. Explain yourself, Nikolai. What are you hinting at? Perhaps you'd better explain yourself, Peter. I saw you take the king of spades from the discards and slip it into your hand. You're accusing me of cheating? Precisely. This is a very serious charge, Captain Silvio. Apologize, you scum. Apologize, do you hear? I'll not retract a word. 
You'll meet me on the field of honor for that, Count Markov. The sooner the better. You'll preside at the duel, Major Voronov? If you wish. Count Markov, as senior officer, it is your privilege to choose the weapons. Pistols. Very well. Pistols. Arrange for seconds, gentlemen. You'll meet on the drill field tomorrow at dawn. Now, now I had found the pretext for a quarrel. Now it would be either Markov or I. I couldn't go on any longer. The thought of what Markov had done to Ilya and myself was driving me mad. Either way, I thought I would win. If I died, the madness that was eating my heart away would die with me. If Markov died, the madness would dissipate and finally vanish. Yes, either way, I would win. Of course, Markov was a cracked pistol shot, but I had the reputation of being a good marksman myself. I gave myself a chance. I could hope a little. We met on the drill field at dawn in full dress according to regiment custom. My hatred for Markov made me icy calm. But Markov was nervous, upset. After all, he had been my friend. We met with Major Voronov. Captain Silvio, are you ready to proceed with this duel? I am, Major. And you, Count Markov? Not quite. I have a request to make of Captain Silvio through you, Major Voronov. Proceed. I have been Captain Silvio's friend for many years. I am not willing to kill him now. If he will apologize, I will consider my honor satisfied. Well, Captain Silvio? There will be no apology, Major. Let's get on with it. Very well. I shall toss a coin, and you, Captain Markov, will call the toss in privilege of your rank. If you call correctly, you will be entitled to the first shot. Is that understood? Yes, sir. Toss the coin. Call it, Count. Heads. Heads it is, Count Markov. You win first shot. Each of you, according to regimental rules, will be entitled to one shot. Is that understood? It is. Yes. Very well. When I begin to count, you gentlemen are to walk ten paces in opposite directions. At ten, you're to turn and face each other. Then, Count Markov, you will fire the first shot. Are you ready? Ready. Yes, sir. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Your shot, Count Markov. <laughs> you missed, Markov. You missed. An inch too high. Yes, yes, you missed. Your shot, Captain Silvio. <laughs> Shoot, Nikolai. What are you waiting for? Shoot and be done. Oh, no, no, Markov. I shall not fire now. I should save the bullet for some time later. Fire your pistol now, you fiend. No, my friend. Out of the goodness of my heart, I shall let you live a while. I will take my shot another time. When the whim suits me. March 18th, 1945, The Weird Circle on Classic Radio Theater with Wyatt Cox. Now on Classic Radio Theater with Wyatt Cox, more of The Weird Circle. Broadcast March 18th, 1945. <laughs> Still, the bells toll on. Twilight comes quickly during the Moscow winter, and already they've turned on the lights in the church where Markov's body lies in state, as befits a Russian nobleman. The yellow light filters through the stained glass windows and spills onto the white snow outside in strange Rococo patterns. Yes, an appropriate day for a funeral. A different day entirely from that lovely spring morning that Peter Markov and I met again. It was our first meeting after the duel. According to Russian army custom, we'd been transferred to different units. He to the 5th Lancers, I to the 9th Dragoons. If I recall, it was Sunday, and the place was certainly Petrograd. I was enjoying a morning gallop through the park when I came upon an officer and a lady resting their horses. I recognized the officer instantly as Peter Markov. Nikolai. Nikolai Silvio. Yes, Markov. We meet again. I, I wondered where you've been these, these three years. 
on duty in the Crimea. But I've kept trace of you, Markov. I've been looking forward to seeing you again. Peter, aren't you going to introduce me to the captain? Hmm? Oh, yes, yes, of course. Uh, Maria, allow me to present Captain Nikolai Silvio. Nikolai Maria Oblensky. Delighted. How do you do? Are you, by any chance, related to General Oblensky, Mademoiselle? <laughs> Rather closely, I would say, Captain. He's my father. Indeed. Mademoiselle, I am honored. Have you known Peter long, Captain? Oh, yes, yes. We are old friends. Aren't we, Markov? Yes. Yes, of course. Uh, uh, Maria. What is it, Peter? Are you ill? You've turned pale. And you seem upset about something. No, no, my dear. I, I'm all right. Uh, Mario, would you excuse Captain Silvio and myself for a few moments? Why, yes, but what... I'd, I... I'd like to talk to him privately. <laughs> Some deep, dark soldier secret, no doubt. Very well, Peter. Go and have your talk. With your permission, mademoiselle? Of course. Now, let's leave the road, Nikolai. There's a little grove of trees over here. You're uh, enjoying good health, Markov? Excellent, thank you. Delighted to hear it. They tell me in the barracks that you've been paying constant court to the general's daughter. Yes, that's true. An excellent prospect, my friend. I'm glad for your sake. You know how interested I am in your future. Look here, Nikolai. I can't stand this any longer. Oh, dear Markov, what are you talking about? You know very well. You know very well what I'm talking about. That shot you're saving for me. When are you going to use it and be done? Why, to tell you the truth, Markov, I hadn't given it much thought. Well, how long are you going to taunt me like this? What kind of revenge do you want? Haven't you had enough? Don't you know how this eats into a man's mind, his soul? To live in the shadow day after day, night after night, waiting for your whim? My dear fellow, do we not wait for all things? Even death? I am not afraid to die, Nikolai. I have faced death before, but I cannot face this waiting, this, this uncertainty. I owe you a debt. One pistol shot. Measure off the paces and collect it now, I beg of you. No, no, Markov. It does not suit my fancy. I'm not ready yet. How long? How long are you going to delay? Patience, my dear Markov, patience. The day is beautiful, and so is the lady. I suggest you go back to her. It's not proper to keep the daughter of a general waiting. <laughs> Every officer in every garrison knew of the debt of honor Peter Markov owed me. There was no way out for him. He had to wait until I was ready to collect my pistol shots. And I waited. Wherever Markov went, I went. He sat in cafes with Maria Oblensky, and I sat at the table opposite him, watching him, saying nothing, just watching him. I made it a point to be at every public function Markov attended. I hounded him with my silent presence and saw him slowly crack. One night I went to the theater, took a seat in a box directly opposite that of Markov and Maria Oblensky. His eyes caught mine, froze in horror. Deliberately I took out my pistol and cocked it. The lights went out and the curtain went up. There in the darkness, Markov and I could not speak with our mouths, but we did speak with our minds. Nikolai, I know you're looking at me, not at the stage. Yes, Markov. And it's a fine play tonight, too. You have your pistol cocked and ready. But you're not going to shoot me here in the theater, are you? I may, Markov. I can see your head framed in the dim light of the lobby passageway. It would be easy. So easy. You can't, Nikolai. Not here. Not while I'm with Maria. It would create a terrible scene. Perhaps. But if there's anything I love, Markov, it's the dramatic. I'll tell you what, my friend. There's plenty of time. I'll just sit here in the darkness and think it over. Perhaps I'll shoot. Perhaps not. Just before intermission, I saw Markov rise and leave the box. The minute the curtain went down, I hurried to the lobby. There I met Maria Oblensky. She was alone, and there was a frightened look in her eyes. Captain Silvio, Captain... Oh, good evening, mademoiselle. But where is Count Markov? He complained of being ill. He left suddenly. Oh, I'm sorry to hear that. Captain Silvio, I... Something's wrong with Peter. He wasn't ill. He was frightened. I could see it in his eyes. They had a... 
well, a haunted look. Really, mademoiselle? Captain, you're an old friend of Peter's. Might I ask a favor of you? Of course, I'm at your service. Would you talk to Peter? Find out what's troubling him. He won't tell me. Perhaps he'll talk to you. It may be that... March 18th, 1945, The Weird Circle here on Classic Radio Theater with Wyatt Cox. We'll have the conclusion and we'll find out what's going on with Speed Gibson and the International Secret Police when Classic Radio Theater with Wyatt Cox continues following these messages from your favorite radio station. Here's Mike Lindell talking about getting your best friend something special. And Mike, you've done it again. You've brought us an amazing line of dog beds. This has been a long time coming. It starts with the same patented fill for your dogs now as we do my pillow. I wanted everything covered in sizes from your largest dog to your smallest dog. You can throw them in the washer and dryer. The dogs love it. They asked, and we, here they are. This is why you get the dog bed. This is the main reason. The dogs love it. And you've got that 10-year warranty, right? I can do it because the dogs love it. They don't want to wreck their bed. And you can get these MyPillow dog beds at a price lower than the big box stores, as low as nineteen ninety five. Call 1-800-928-4715, 1-800-928-4715, or go to MyPillow.com slash pet and use my promo code Wyatt. Treat your best friend to a MyPillow dog pet. MyPillow.com slash pet. Promo code Wyatt. Now on Classic Radio Theater with Wyatt Cox, the conclusion of The Weird Circle and the Pistol Shot, March 18th, 1945. Then you'll talk to him as an old friend. Naturally, mademoiselle, as an old friend. I shall be delighted. What a twist. What a beautiful irony. Here was Maria Oblensky, now engaged to Markov, begging me, me, Nikolai Silvio, to find out what was wrong with him. I tasted my triumph, savored it, treasured it. I would, in good time, bring it to full flower. And then suddenly, the dragoons received orders to quit Petrograd and move north in a swift attempt to crush the Tatars who'd revolted. Weeks later, I led my unit into a birch forest with orders to engage and divert a strong force of Tartars, while a troop of lancers were to deliver a crushing attack on the barbarian's flank. We met the Tartars in a bloody battle, were hard-pressed, our reinforcements were delayed. We waited for the lancers, led by my friend Peter Markov, to attack on the flank. But they never came. The onrushing Tartars slaughtered our troops almost to the last man, and I, I was the last man. But as far as Peter Markov and the rest of the world knew, I was dead. I preferred it that way. Finally, I came to Moscow, shabby, bearded, unknown, with my pistol hidden under my ragged coat. A newspaper told me that Markov and Maria Oblensky were to be married that week. A reception in their honor was being held that afternoon. They would return, I was sure, to Markov's apartment for supper. I watched the servant preparing the table, and when my chance came, I forced my way through the window and waited. <laughs> oh, Maria, my darling. Here we are. Oh, yes, Peter, after all those people. Oh, I'm so tired. Come inside, Maria. We'll rest and have supper oh. before we go to the theater. The servant will be back shortly. I sent him to the cellar for wine. Hey, what? Hello, Markov. Oh! Who are you? What are you doing in my apartment? Don't you recognize me, Markov? Nikolai. Nikolai Silvio. Yes, my friend. But I... I thought... I know. You thought I was dead. Peter, what's Captain Silvio doing here? I've come to collect a debt, mademoiselle. A debt long overdue. Nikolai, listen, I... I've come to take that pistol shot, Marco. Nikolai, you can't. Now, listen to me. I'm going to be married. My life's just beginning. I've got so much to look forward to. Remember Ilya Stanovich, Marco? I was in love with her, too. We were to be married. Captain Silvio, what are you... 
What are you going to do with that gun? Ask your fiancé, mademoiselle. But this is murder. Oh, no, no, no. We fought a duel, mademoiselle. He fired at me and missed, and now it's my turn. Nikolai, Nikolai, no, please. Please, Nikolai, my friend. No, I, I beg of you, see. See, I get down on my knees. Don't shoot. I, I want to live. I, I want to live now. This is like a pretty tale. Count Peter Markov on his knees begging for his life. A Russian officer of noble birth. <laughs> ah. Peter, get up. Why, you don't you understand? He, he... Captain Silvio. Yes, mademoiselle. You are a man of honor and principle. You've seen this groveling wretch beg for his life. Isn't that revenge enough? Yes, mademoiselle. You're right. I cannot kill him now. See, I place my pistol on the table. My honor is satisfied. Thank you, Captain Sylvia. I bid you good evening, mademoiselle. Wait, Captain, I'm... I'm going with you. What? Maria, have you gone mad? You cannot go. Stay with me. I will never marry you, Peter. To live with a craven coward like yourself. Yes, to bear your children would be intolerable. Shall we go, Captain? Very well, mademoiselle. Maria, in the name of heaven, Maria, don't leave... Don't leave me. Don't leave me. Believe me, mademoiselle Oblensky, I'm sorry. No, Captain, you need not be. You've done me a service, and I'm grateful. What was that? Markov! Markov! Oh! Markov, what is it? What have you done? (laughs) Nikolai, I picked up the pistol you left. I hardly touched it. It went off. It was fate. It was justice. Just payment, yes, Nikolai. The time has come at last. The debt is paid. Paid in full. At last. Peter. Mademoiselle, the moment for payment has come at last. And I was more lenient than my gun. Although I would spare his life, my gun would not. Shall we proceed, mademoiselle? eulogy to Markov is over. They're opening the church doors, the pallbearers are carrying the body out, and the church bells seem louder. I shall follow the funeral procession, of course. I shall watch with bared head while they lower the body into the grave. Yes, this is the least that I can do. After all, Markov was my friend. March 18, 1945, The Weird Circle on Classic Radio Theater with Wyatt Cox. Now on Classic Radio Theater with Wyatt Cox, an episode of Speed Gibson of the International Secret Police. This episode goes back to March 18, 1939. Speed Gibson! Of the International Secret Police. Thank you. 
Bailey offers to take Marie Duchamp to the home of her friends in Casablanca, Morocco, while Speed and Clint attend to the business of cabling Chief Riley the latest developments of their flight to Africa. Smiley was to have returned to the telegraph office, but after an hour passes, the boys decide to go to the address the girl gave them and see what is keeping him. They discover an empty house, but once inside, decide to search every room and hope they might find some key to the mystery. In the woman's quarters, they find an ominous clue to their friend's disappearance. His lucky rabbit's foot, stained with blood. Clint wastes no more time in the menacing Moorish house, but with speed goes to the offices of the Moroccan police, where we now find him talking with Ahmed, a Moor of great intelligence and head of the Moroccan police. So that's the whole story, Ahmed. Marie Duchamp was very certain as to that address when she wrote it down for my nephew. She knew that it was an empty house all the time. Now that I've had a little time to think it out, I believe that she was the tool of the octopus gang, who planned to ambush us one by one. The first one, whoever brought her to the house. And the others, Speed and I, tonight perhaps. It appears that way, Mr. Barlow. And what was that address again? 167 Luzon. Luzon. Oh, yes. The oldest section of the city. And this rabbit's foot you mentioned. Oh, yes, here it is in this handkerchief. We were careful not to touch it with anything else. You may be able to discover something from it. I shall send it up to our laboratory immediately. We shall probably have the report before you leave here. One moment, please. You call? Yes. Take this to the laboratory for analysis. Tell them to give particular attention to the blood spot. Ascertain whether it is human blood or not. I want a detailed report as soon as possible. Yes, it shall be done. Next, I want a cable chief Riley, but first... What of the men you spoke of sending to the Lucerne Street address? They have already gone, Mr. Barlow. They left shortly after you reported Mr. Preston's disappearance and probable fate. They will search the house thoroughly. Very well. I'd like to be with them, but I think I can accomplish more here. No doubt. As for your cable, our private telegrapher is in the next office. He will cooperate with you in any way you desire. Thank you. It may take a little time. you better wait here with Ahmed Speed. Okay, Clint. All right, I'll let you know what Chief Riley has to say the moment I receive a reply. Hmm, you are sad, Speed? I'm worried about Smiley, sir. It looks kind of bad, doesn't it? We Moroccans are fatalists, Speed. We believe a man's fate is written before he is born, and nothing he can do can change it. I, I don't think I like that, Ahmed. Now you are seeing the dark side of the glass. My young friend, do not forget there is a brighter side. But if something has really happened to Smiley, we never see him again. Well, I'm not used to having that happen to someone I know real well. And let it be a lesson, Speed. As a member of the secret police, you are living dangerously. Your own life is in constant jeopardy, and yet... Would you have it otherwise? I should say not. Then why mourn for your friend? If he has died in the work he has chosen, do you think he would have wanted it any other way? We all must go, soon or late. And if he has gone, he went doing the thing he loved best. Yeah. Yeah, I begin to see what you mean. You are young, but wise beyond your years. Now your heart must learn to let go. Things are changing constantly. Nothing remains stationary. Never forget that speed. You will then appreciate every little thing you have in your hands. Yeah. Thank you, sir. It is well. So our city of white and gold, our Casablanca, has not always resembled a modern metropolis. Not so very long ago, before we built our harbor to bring the ships of the world to our shores, the Arabs of the mountains, fighting nomads who lived in tents, used to descend on the Moors, their city brothers, to mock their culture and attempt to destroy. Now, since the French control Morocco, this seldom happens. But the feeling still exists. It is not wise to journey alone in the mountains. Gosh, that sure is interesting, Ahmed. Tell me some more about your country. Oh, there is so much I can tell you. Well, at last I have my reply from Chief Riley. Oh, in which case you may desire to speak with your nephew privately, Mr. Barlow. I shall leave you two alone and see how the laboratory analysis is progressing. Why, I thank you, Ahmed. I only desire to serve in whatever way I can. Boy, he's sure a great fella, Clint. But what did you hear from the chief? What did he say about smiling? Miss Bean, I don't like to tell you, but you'll have to know it sooner or later. Chief Riley doesn't believe we'll ever see Smiley again. Yeah, I kind of figured that. But Ahmed talked to me about it all, and 
Made me feel better about it. Well, good. Because these things are apt to happen to any of us. I've lost many a good friend in the line of duty. That's a chance we all have to take. I know. But there was some good news in the chief's cable. What? Carlos Del Valle is in Africa. Who? I've never told you about Carlos, have I? Not that I remember. And I think I'd remember a name like that. Well, that's because he's generally on foreign duty. He's one of the most valued members of our service. Speaks several different languages and, though young in years, has had a world of experience. His name sounds Spanish or Mexican. No, he's a South American. He was born in the Argentine and rode in his father's big cattle ranch as a gaucho when he was a boy. And then he joined the secret police. <laughs> he's been kept on the jump ever since. Does the chief want us to look him up? We're going to meet him in Mazagan. Well, where's that? Oh, it isn't very far from here. Riley's already cable Carlos, and he's starting for the town immediately. He will arrive by the time everything is settled here in Casablanca. You mean Carlos going to take Smiley's place? Yes, please. We must have someone with us who knows Africa well. Carlos does. We're very fortunate to have him as a working partner. Yeah, that'll be great. Now, don't take this too hard, Speed. It's been a shock, I know, but after all, we're not sure about Smiley yet. We're just surmising the worst. But I've got a feeling that we're not wrong, Clint. How are we going to get to this Mazagon? Fly? Yes. The Bled, a great rolling plain, lies between Casablanca and Mazagon. It's hot and seared by the sun this season of the year. We'll fly all right, and it'll still seem too far. Well, how do we know where Carlos is going to be? Well, we're to meet him in Spinney's Garden. Huh? Oh, you'll hear a lot about Spinney and Mazagon. An Englishman. He dealt with the Moors for 50 years and was well loved by the Kaids and head tribesmen. They made him their confidant. As a matter of fact... The most binding oath a Moor can give today is Spinney's word. <laughs> That's the height of honor. Seems to me you know plenty about Africa yourself, Clint. Oh, not a working knowledge, Speed. But Spinney is famous in our organization. He's made our work in Africa a lot easier because of his excellent reputation. And we're to meet Carlos in his garden, which surrounds his house, one week from today. You think we'll have all our business straightened out by that time? Easily. We're working fast on Smiley's disappearance. In a case of that kind, the more time we take... The less chance we have of finding him. Yeah, but I wish we'd get that report on his rabbit's foot. Oh, here's Ahmed now. Have they finished the laboratory tests, Ahmed? Yes, Speed. I have it all here, but I can tell it in a few words. The blood on the foot is human blood. Oh. Looks bad, then. Yes. And to make matters worse, there were no other identifying signs on it. No clues of any sort. The rabbit's foot must have fallen from your friend's pocket when he was ambushed. I see. Ahmed... Have your men come back from 167 Lusanne Street yet? No, not yet. Good. I'll join them. No, don't go, Clint. I don't want the same thing to happen to you that happened to Smiley. Well, don't you worry. I won't be alone as Smiley was. But what good will it do? Marie Duchamp and those who waited in that empty house couldn't have disappeared into thin air. Neither could they have left by the front door if they had Smiley with them. There was blood on his rabbit's foot, but nowhere else. You believe they left by a secret way? Yes, I did. And we found that foot by a carved panel. That may be the entrance to the passage. Well, if you go, I'm going. No. For once, you're going to keep out of danger, Speed. I'll have plenty of assistance from Ahmed's police. You stay here where you're safe. Gee, Clint, please don't go. That house gives me an, an awful feeling. No matter if you had an army with you, if you go in there, you may never come out again. Speed, nothing will stop me until I find Marie Duchamp and her accomplices. Smiley's disappearance has started something, and I'm going to fight back. If I can just get my hands on my enemies... Ahmed, can't you stop him? Your uncle is right, Speed. We must do everything in our power to locate these criminals. I shall go with you, Mr. Barlow. I hope you would, Ahmed. But what about Speed? Never fear. He shall be well guarded against harm. Good. How soon can we leave? Immediately, if you wish. Please, Clint. Now, listen, Speed. I'll be all right. Don't you worry. When you see me again, I'll have Marie Duchamp and the others. If they're in Casablanca, we'll find them. Come, Ahmed. <laughs> Master. Yes, Zabul. Word has come from Casablanca. He who was known as Smiley Preston is no more. Operator 9, the girl, and those with her have destroyed him. <laughs> Good. One by one, we shall wipe out these secret police before they have a chance to look into the business of the Atlantean syndicate. Crippled though I am now, I can yet destroy Barlow and Speed Gibson. Barlow is now on his way to 167 Luzon Street. What? 
Yes, he is determined to avenge the death of Preston, to find Marie Duchamp and the others. Are the Moroccan police still searching the house? Yes. But Ahmed, the leader? He comes with Barlow. The boy remains at the police station under guard for safety's sake. So they are separated, eh? <laughs> Barlow is a fool when angered. Good. I shall destroy them, as I destroyed Preston. It is easier when they are not together. One thing more. Barlow cabled his chief in New York and received an answer. Our operator cannot say what the message was. It was in code. So? Get in touch with Casablanca on the shortwave radio once again. Do you wish to speak with Operator 9 in person, Master? Yes. For the time being, I wish the boy and Barlow to be taken alive. I must learn the police code. And I think I can best learn it from the boy. <laughs> yes, Master. I have a very clever yet a very simple plan, Zabul. One that will draw the Moroccan police away from 167 Luzon. And from their own station as well. Then... <laughs> then I shall have my enemies exactly where I want them. And there will be no escape. <laughs> From March 18, 1939, Speed Gibson of the International Secret Police here on Classic Radio Theater with Wyatt Cox. Thank you so much for making us a part of your day. Thank this radio station. Support their advertisers. It is their kindness and courtesy that allow us to be with you each and every time we roll around here on your favorite radio station. Your cards and letters really make a difference. Uh, now, if you miss a day, you don't have to miss a single show. All of our shows are available on demand at our webpage, which is classicradio.stream. Stream our shows on demand. We produce 21 hours of classic radio theater each and every week. Uh, you can find our social media links there. You can learn about building a classic radio collection of your own. You can also uh, contact me. You can find uh, yeah, how to build a classic radio collection of your own and you can buy me a coffee that buy me a coffee money goes toward us uh, acquiring additional classic radio collections and keeping our infrastructure up and running that is classic radio dot stream thanks for tuning in thank this station support their advertisers tell your friends the great radio shows are right here at this spot on the dial classic radio theater with wyatt cox on your favorite radio station